Hi everyone, it's Katrina, Ranger Randy Morganson. Randy Morganson was 64 years old when he disappeared on July 21, 1996. It was his 28th season as a backcountry ranger in the Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. He was the top ranger in the High Sierra, more experienced than anyone else in that particular stretch of wilderness. But Randy had been expressing difficulty recently. He was tired of what he personally called Swinus Americanus. That was the way Randy described the new breed of backpacking tourists who threw their litter in the forest and were generally awful to deal with. On July 21st, Randy left a note on his tent saying he would be gone for two or three days. Then he left his station near Bench Lake. He left his 357 Magnum behind, and Randy would remain missing for the next five years. Kings Canyon National Park is right next to Sequoia National Park. The two are presided over by the National Park Service as a kind of duo. Even though they are different, they still represent one massive wilderness. Sequoia has 400,000 acres, with mountains over 14,000 feet above sea level. Kings Canyon is most famous for its mile-deep canyon and remote rivers. Most of the backcountry rangers in the 1996 season had been reporting for duty for over a decade. They didn't get paid very much, but their families did receive a payment of $100,000 if they died on duty in the park. Randy had been feeling a little blue at the start of the season. He had recently received divorce papers from his wife, Judy. In the early days, Judy had joined him in the backcountry while he worked as a ranger, but she had gotten bored and stopped going. Once that happened, Randy fell for a fellow ranger named Lo Linus. The pair had an affair, and Judy filed for divorce. It was an enormous mess. Right before Randy went missing, he told a colleague that he wondered if being a ranger for so many years had been worth it. Ranger Rick Sanger discovered Randy's note and reported him missing on July 25, 1996. What followed was one of the most epic searches in ranger history, mostly because they were looking for one of their own. Randy had been a ranger for 28 seasons, meaning if he was missing, it was likely that he was in big trouble. Almost 100 rescue operators searched 80 square miles of forest. They found his car, so they knew he was somewhere in the park, but there was just no sign of him. Dogs couldn't sniff him out. A Fleur helicopter with infrared couldn't find him. And after almost two weeks, the search had to end. After 13 days of searching, not a single trace of Randy was found. Five years later, in 2001, a member of the California Conservation Corps ventured off the trail and came across human remains. Park rangers discovered a withered shirt with Randy's badge still pinned to it. They also discovered his backpack and a boot. The boot was partially stuck in a mucky sinkhole. It also had a sharp white leg bone sticking out from it. His radio was recovered at the scene, switched to the on position. The rangers were baffled because they remembered searching the exact place where the human remains were found. Some suspected Randy didn't die in the gorge, but that his body was dumped there after the search was called off. Others suspected he fell through a snow bridge and broke his leg. During the rescue attempt in 1996, his wife had a dream of a dead man floating in a lake. Could it have been a vision of Randy at the bottom of the icy gorge? Some of the rangers think that Randy's death wasn't an accident. He felt guilty about his affair with the other ranger. With his death being an accident, his wife benefited from the $100,000 payout from the government. Randy may have planned the whole thing to give his wife the money and be gone for good. But because so many years had passed and the remains were in such poor shape, there was never any conclusive decision made about the cause of death. Nobody knows what really happened to Randy Morganson. And now for a case in Death Valley. But first, it's shout out time. I want to give a huge thank you to Georgia Sutherland and SHG Gaming for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos about amazing discoveries and some historical mysteries. Terror in Death Valley In July 2023, Steve Curry decided it would be exciting to experience the brutal heat of Death Valley. Shortly after his arrival at the National Park, the 71-year-old Los Angeles man was discovered dead at a trailhead. He was found collapsed outside a public toilet in Golden Canyon just after 3 in the afternoon. Steve journeyed to the park to experience the blistering heat wave, and it killed him. The heat reached an unimaginable 121 degrees Fahrenheit. That's almost 50 degrees Celsius. According to National Park Service officials, Steve had been hiking a popular trail before he dropped on his way out. 
Steve's wife, Rima Curry, told reporters that Steve always had a desire to go to Death Valley. She said he was determined to hike during one of the hottest days in Death Valley's recorded history. He insisted it was the one hike he needed to take. He managed to complete the short circuit, but the heat got him before he could get back to his car. Rima described Steve as a loving man with a good soul and a good heart. He loved the outdoors and loved spending time with friends and family. Before you get too judgmental, it wasn't like Steve showed up to the park unprepared either. Earlier in the day, a reporter with the Los Angeles Times interviewed Steve. He was seen smothered in sunscreen like he had poured an entire bottle of it on his skin. After his interview, he hiked to Zabritsky Point, a distance of about two miles from Golden Canyon. At some point during the hike, Steve turned around to go back to his car. Just as he got to the restrooms, he collapsed from exhaustion. Park visitors called 911, and park rangers arrived about 15 minutes later. They used an external defibrillator and administered CPR, but there was nothing they could do to save him. Although the cause of death was not immediately determined, park rangers did suspect that heat was a major factor. The official temperature was 121 degrees Fahrenheit, but the National Park Service said the real temperature inside the canyon was most likely significantly higher. The walls of the canyon radiate heat from the sun as if they were layered in tinfoil. Steve and Rima were married for 29 years before Steve took his final hike into Death Valley. Cold Case and Shenandoah Julianne Williams and Lolly Winans were in their mid-twenties during the spring of 1996. One Sunday morning in May, they set out early with their golden retriever to hike through the Shenandoah National Park in Virginia. The young women were extremely excited for the adventure, so was their dog Taj. But shortly into their hike, both women were brutally murdered. They set up camp for the night at a quiet campsite, only to become the victims of an insane killer. Despite suspicions and suspects, the murders have never been solved. It's been over 25 years, and the FBI is still investigating what happened to Julianne Williams and Lolly Winnin. Lolly had a privileged upbringing, born into a wealthy family from Michigan, but she was a free spirit and rejected the wealth and privilege given to her by birth. After her graduation from high school, she dropped out of college. In 1994, Lolly moved to Maine and worked as a wilderness guide. Julianne, who went by Julie, was a big fan of sports and geology. She won the Minnesota State Double Tennis Championship while in high school. After graduation, she traveled through Europe and studied dinosaurs. Julie was big into the community. She met Lolly at a charity event in 1994. A nonprofit organization was raising money for adventure travel for women. It was a company called Woods Women Inc., run by women and serving exclusively women. During the charity event, Julie and Lolly got along very well. They developed a strong relationship, brought together by their mutual passion for the outdoors. Their relationship developed over the next two years. Then came the fateful trip to Shenandoah National Park. This park is absolutely enormous. Originally founded in 1935, the park stretches across the Blue Ridge Mountains and covers an area of about 197,000 acres. There are over 500 miles of twisting hiking trails. Within the 80,000 acres of designated wilderness, it's easy to get lost. But Julie and Lolly didn't get lost. They pitched their tent next to a horse trail at a peaceful spot beside a mountain stream. Then they were killed. On May 31st, Julie's father reported the girls missing. Park rangers discovered their car and began combing through the nearby trails. They came across Taj first, the golden retriever. The dog was wandering around without a leash and without its owners. On June 1st, searchers came across their camp. It was only half a mile from where they had parked. Lolly was discovered inside the tent, bound with duct tape and partially undressed. Julie was found about 40 feet away down an embankment. Police also found a camera which contained photos of their hike. Even though park visitors were in danger because a murderer was on the loose, the park service waited 36 hours to announce what happened. Park superintendent Greg Stiles called it an isolated incident. The FBI said the murders were random. The investigation went nowhere. The next year, in July 1997, a Canadian tourist was assaulted very near to where Julianne and Lolly were found. Luckily, a park ranger showed up and the attacker was apprehended. His name was Daryl David Rice. When police searched his vehicle, they found leg restraints and other disturbing artifacts. The subsequent investigation showed that Rice was fired from his old job for being extremely hostile. He was violent and abusive to his co-workers. 
In 1998, he pleaded guilty to attempted abduction of the Canadian tourist. He was given 135 months in a federal penitentiary. In 2001, he was indicted for the murders of Julianne Williams and Lolly Winnins, but a lack of forensics made the case fall apart. Police also tried to nail Rice with the unsolved murder of Alicia Reynolds, also killed in the spring of 1996. But there was no forensic evidence for that case either, and Rice avoided any charges. Do you think investigators should reopen this case? Let me know in the comments! And be sure to subscribe if you haven't already! Bear Attack in Yellowstone In July 2023, a woman was killed in Yellowstone National Park by a grizzly bear. On the Buttermilk Trail, about eight miles from the town of West Yellowstone, a hiker came across the victim's body early on a Saturday morning. According to the Montana Department of Fish, Wildlife and Parks, the victim was found just a few hundred yards from the trailhead. Her wounds were consistent with a bear attack. Although nobody saw a bear on sight, game wardens did uncover tracks from an adult grizzly leading off into the forest. The adult tracks were joined by the smaller tracks of a bear cub. The bear didn't try to eat the woman, who appeared to have been jogging when the animal attacked. Morgan Jacobson from the Parks Department said the woman was likely out for a leisurely morning jog when the incident took place. The bear was simply defending its cub from what it viewed as a threat when the woman came jogging towards it. She was found wearing running shoes. She didn't have any bear spray or other animal deterrents that are highly recommended to those jogging in Yellowstone. She may have surprised the bear, which is the worst possible thing a person can do. If the bear is surprised, it's much more likely to feel the need to defend itself. Jacobson said the department hasn't decided yet if they will kill or relocate the adult bear. Authorities have already put up traps and have used an aircraft to try and spot the bear. The West Yellowstone residents weren't too worried by the attack. Local man Bill Youngworth rents vacation homes near the forest where the attack took place. He always tells people to take bear spray and to make sure they know how to use it. But more importantly, Bill tells them not to go down the trails alone. Grizzly bear attacks are rare but not impossible. Since 2010, grizzly bears in the Yellowstone area have killed about nine people. Murder in the Grand Canyon It was a cold day in January 1977 when Michael and Charlotte Sherman visited Grand Canyon National Park. It was snowing, the winter wind was blowing, and there weren't very many tourists around. Even with limited visibility because of the icy fog, Michael and Charlotte stopped at the park to take in the sights. They were on their way home to California following a trip to Texas. But the couple never made it back to their home in the sunny state. Both of them were made to kneel on the ground, then were executed with a gunshot to the back of the head just before 11 a.m. Their killer, or killers, have never been apprehended. Joe Sumner worked on the case as a services branch agent. It was the first case he had ever heard of in which two people were robbed and murdered in the middle of broad daylight at a national park. Joe believed somebody was lying in wait. Somebody was waiting for the right opportunity to commit a heinous crime. In 1977, the investigators concluded the motivation behind the double murder was robbery. Michael's wallet was missing and Charlotte's purse had been taken. Neither have ever been found. Both were shot twice with a 22 caliber handgun. Their bodies were dragged away and stashed at the Powell Memorial. It was a very elaborate crime just to steal a wallet and a purse. Those who were visiting the Grand Canyon at the same time reported seeing a man and a woman in the vicinity. The pair were driving a light tan station wagon, the kind with a ski rack on the top. These people have never been identified. Though in 2013, the cold case unit did get a tip the couple were in Georgia. Investigators traveled to Georgia and spoke with a couple who fit the description from 1977. They thought they might be onto something because the man was serving a life sentence for a similar robbery homicide, but it turned out to be a dead end. Investigators are still trying to figure out what happened, but the case is ice cold. Joe Sumner did resubmit evidence collected at the crime scene, specifically DNA from an unknown individual, but there has yet to be a match. Rocky Mountain National Park Death Spree Death has come to Rocky Mountain National Park. In July 2023, three people died in the park in just over two weeks. One of them was a 26-year-old woman from Colorado. She passed away when she fell 500 feet off the side of a cliff. According to Rocky Mountain National Park authorities, the woman was free solo climbing Blitzen Ridge when she lost her grip. Free solo climb is when a person goes mountain climbing without any kind of protective gear. 
They don't have a harness, no helmet. They climb an extremely dangerous piece of rock with nothing but their own physical strength. It is one of the most dangerous forms of climbing that a person can do. The victim was later identified as Bailey Mulholland. Her fall was reported by her climbing partner, a 27-year-old man from Boulder. He was able to use his cell phone to notify the park rangers. Then he had to be rescued with a helicopter from nearby Buckley Air Force Base because of his remote location. After he was recovered, rescuers found Bailey's body at the bottom of the ridge. The coroner later ruled her death accidental, caused by blunt force trauma. Bailey wasn't the only recent victim of Rocky Mountain National Park. One week earlier, a 24-year-old man from Las Vegas drowned at West Creek Falls. Then, a week after Bailey's fall, a 51-year-old man from Louisiana was found dead near the Mount Ida trailhead. Tragedy in Big Bend A tragic series of events just unfolded in Big Bend National Park. A man from Florida took his teenage stepson's hiking in extreme heat during the brutal heat wave of June 2023. One of his stepsons was only 14 years old, the other was 21. They were hiking in the middle of the afternoon when the younger stepson suddenly fell ill. He was seriously heat fatigued, which should be no surprise because the temperature was around 110 degrees Fahrenheit. The trio were hiking the Marufo Vega Trail. First, the 14-year-old boy got sick, but they kept hiking anyway. Then the boy lost consciousness. His stepfather chose to hike back to the car so that he could get help. He left the 21-year-old to carry his younger brother back to the trailhead. Authorities weren't alerted to the emergency situation until 6 o'clock at night. The park rangers and U.S. Border Patrol agents didn't reach the 14-year-old until 7.30. By that time, he was already deceased. Authorities then started looking for the father who had disappeared. They discovered his vehicle crashed on the other side of an embankment. It's not exactly clear what happened, only that the stepfather crashed his car while trying to get help. He too was likely disoriented and exhausted from the heat, which may have been what caused him to lose control of the car. At the end of the day, the 21-year-old walked out of the park alone. His brother was dead, and his stepfather too. According to the Park Service, the Marufo Vega Trail is extraordinarily dangerous. It's a winding pathway that leads through rugged desert and rough cliffs inside the hottest part of Big Bend National Park. There is no shade, plus the trail is considered strenuous. Even when it isn't hot, it's a dangerous place to walk. Trying to walk it in 119-degree heat is something that should never even be attempted. A similar thing happened to a 75-year-old man from Houston in July 2022. He was discovered dead less than a mile from the start of the trail. Thanks for watching. Have you ever been in a dangerous situation while hiking or visiting a national park? Let us know in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe and stay safe out there. Bye!